So, friends, uh, from here on, uh, we discussed the play, the, the, the text, uh, uh, a long journey into night. And uh, there will be characters, there will be situations, there will be messages, there will be uh, tones, there will be suggestions, all of them. And they will form into a kind of response that the play finally is. So, uh, may I request uh, Professor Bajaj to give us a peep into the, the, the vision and, 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 and the view of the text that we discussed today. <coughs> yeah, thank you. So, we are uh, discussing uh, Long Day's Journey into Night and um, this play by uh, Eugene O'Neill is, uh, as I said, you know, he's all seen as the father of modern American drama. Now, this, there's a very unique quality about his uh, plays, which is the, the uh, kind of mimetic power that it has, you know. So, the mimetic power of his plays really is the center of um, this discussion also, which means that, you know, the gestures and glances in the play, they play a very important role. Right in the dedication, you know, um, O'Neill uh, mentioned that this play is really, um, this play is a play of old sorrow written in tears and blood. Uh, you know, this is the uh, this is uh, this is the quote that I have used from O'Neill's uh, dedication. Now, uh, he, it's it's an autobiographical play, and it is a play that ha that's dealing with an old sorrow of his, which, according to him, is written in tears and blood. So you find that already what is established for us right in the beginning is this kind of uh, emotion, which is at the center of the play, right? So feelings and emotions are really central to this play, and so you would note that. Uh, um, being articulate or characters are often not articulate enough to speak their mind but their gestures and glances they do all the talking then so this play is very strong in terms of its stage directions it's actually uh, it's also very interesting if you just read the play that each dialogue is uh, you know has an adjective attached to it as has a stage direction attached to it that how this dialogue is to be played uh, so for instance you know there will be a scene where uh, Mary is talking to her husband and you know she'd be fidgety you know or she'd be uncomfortable or looking away so you know for each dialogue there is a kind of a stage direction which suggests the gesture and the kind of uh, mimetic quality of the scene and this in fact adds to the intensity of drama in the Play. You know, there is a kind of intensity which is added because of these um, uh, these kind of uh, actions that are taking place, almost like, you know, and there is a lyrical quality to it. In fact, we are told that uh, Mary, you know, there is a, there is been one very strong sort of, uh, you know, reference of Mary's fingers. You know, we are told that she had these long fingers that and, and this kind of drumming of her fingers on the table, you know, creates a lyrical quality and suggests her nervousness. Now, uh, this kind, this is a kind of a kind of a, uh, you know, kind of a pantomime plays, for instance, between uh, the mother and the son while they are just looking at one another and her uh, fingers drumming on the table, you know, there is a kind of lyrical quality created through it which is a very which is which is very which makes the scene very dramatic and intense so this is something which is a very peculiar quality and a unique quality about Eugene O'Neill's drama and must be taken uh, you know paid attention to now let's look at the characters in the play when you look at James Tyrone, who is basically the father, he's 65 years old and we are told that he looks younger, he's remarkably good looking. He's a simple, unpretentious man who's aware of his humble beginnings of Irish fa farmer family. Now, that's the kind of stage direction we are given. But we also find, uh, when as we read the play, that James Tyrone is vain. He is also self-absorbed and self-obsessed uh, with his journey, which is rags to riches. You know, he's made it big so he knows the value of the dollar he keeps reminding his children about the value of the dollar because he came, he was a penniless fellow and his mother scrubbed uh, you know dishes at uh, somebody's house and they, they didn't have anything to eat uh, they didn't never had a full meal and how at the age of 10 uh, the father had to really work hard to uh, make money for the family so it's 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 a man who is also uh, very sturdy and so we are told that he has never been really sick 
a day in his life and he has no nerves and there is a lot of that stolid earthy peasant in him which is the Irish peasant you know the stolid earthy peasant so he's a man who's very much uh, you know uh, about the basics and yet we also so you know this is the side that is given to us by the playwright but remember the characters in the play that is his own children and wife have a different view they don't think of him as this uh, you know this pleasant figure who is tolled or the peasant they see him as a stingy father you know as a kind of a penny pincher as as somebody who's uh, who's miserly who would uh, save on money who would go to quacks and not go to a real doctor because he says you know i'm no millionaire who's going to pay doc- the millionaire's fee to a doctor so and his wife uh, you know accuses him for doing that to her uh, when he could have taken given her a better medical condition treatment when she was ill after the second birth so, uh, or the third birth uh, of edmund because her second child really dies so uh, the you know after edmund's birth that she she c- accuses him of not being uh, not taking care of her properly through a proper doctor and finding a kind of a neighborhood quack who really gave her uh, some morphine to get rid of her pain till she became addicted to morphine so so you know there is this kind of accusations which are leveled against one another and you find that in each you know the, the family all members are actually blaming one another for whatever is happening in their lives um for perhaps a better reason and and the the vital truth remains that you know they they're all uh, at at the edge and uh, they're not uh, you know that that the outside world that the surroundings around them they are really not able to accept them and they are not accepting what the real world really wants them to be so uh, at the end of the day they're actually blaming one another for whatever has gone wrong in their own lives so you find that uh, and mostly mostly you find it is the father who's blamed by everyone you know whether they they are the two children or the wife and the father who otherwise in this stage direction is told to us that he is an unpretentious man and a simple good looking fellow and of irish farmer family a stolid earthy fellow um uh, mixed with streaks of say sentimental melancholy and rare flashes of intuitive sensibility so he doesn't have that intuitive sensibility for instance that his wife does so he is a very much a man of the ground of the of of the of the field and that's what becomes this uh, the father the uh, that is james tyron now tyron is married of course to mary and mary is uh, for uh, 54 years old again uh, as we know that uh, tyron was 65 and mary is 54 years old she would have been very beautiful in her prime is what we are told she was she's extremely nervous and that's what makes you see in many ways it is about this plays about uh, this couple and their fallen marriage or their failed marriage and uh, the cost of which is borne by the mother who's then hysterical and mad at the end and is has become uh, you know becomes uh, addicted to morphine so there is a kind of a nervousness about uh, mary that comes across because she can't keep her hands still and her hands now have become uh, crippled which were once pretty because of rheumatism now uh, you see again there is a kind of um symbol that also runs through the play for instance the symbol of the fog you know we are told that uh, mary could not sleep the whole night because there was fog and fog horns and they uh, you know they are near the shore so the fog horn would go on the whole night and they could not sleep and mary keeps um reminding them that the you know even though the sun has shone very soon the fog will take over and even when james says that no i think it's going to be a sunny day mary um you know uh, you know asserts that no i know that the fog will return so fog Fog, the return of the fog in a way is return uh, is the return of the old sense of tragedy that has been haunting this house now it's very interesting that uh, mary's uh, morphine addiction is never spoken of in in the first three acts it's only li- very late in the play that we realize that what what is she addicted to you know there is a sense in the first scene for instance um if you just look at the a uh, structure in the timeline of the play you will notice that act 1 has at the center the living room of uh, the tyrons summer house where they would come together for a brief time before they would leave for their own places so it's their summer home and they've come to their summer home and it's uh, 8:30 a.m. 
in in a day in august in 1912 when act 1 actually takes shape mary and edmund are in, at the center because um, there is a kind of mystery which is surrounding both uh, edmund is ill and there is a sense that you know that he's very 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 sick but nobody is ready to acknowledge it on the other hand mary is looked at with suspicion everybody is staring at her and looking suspicious at uh, suspiciously at her and so there is a kind of an uneasy past and a history that we are reminded of but it is never was spoken of in act 1 so we 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 don't know what's wrong but everybody is everybody suspects mary and everybody is staring at mary we don't know what's going on act 2 actually uh, creates a better scene for us when the same act has moved to act 2 the it's the same day but we move from 8:30 am to 12:45 right and around 12:45 we know that mary there is a sense that mary has relapsed into consuming morphine but it is again never told to us right it is something that uh, that the characters uh, that the family members become aware of the father the um, uh, sons they look at her and they know that she has uh, again gone back to being an addict and this is a new phase and then again she'd have to go to the you know to to the hospital to be cured etc so there is a kind of a cycle which is getting repeated here but again in act 2 we don't know what's really wrong with mary and what has really happened by the time there is act 2 scene 2 the same about half an hour later and you know that there is a kind of helpless resignation in the family everybody has given up they have almost given up on edmund who they think is going to die and they've almost given up on the mother mary who they know has fallen back and relapsed and has become gone into consuming morphine again again act 3 takes us to uh, the evening that is 6:30 in the evening when uh, both edmund and jamie they have been drunk and they've gone to the doctor and the doctor has revealed to edmund that he is he has tuberculosis and he has consumption now uh, the the idea of consumption or you know the the consumption is spoken of earlier also in the play because mary is really scared that edmund has it because she fears that because her father had it and he died of it so in a way there is a family history and a past which is in a way uh, haunting them and returning in the present and that's i think a very the central part of this play that this play really talks about and and this is where you know uh, in a way eugene o'neil comes very close to strindberg also you know the idea for instance in uh, naturalism and this is something that um, eugene o'neil actually um, uh, talked about his uh, debt to strindberg in his nobel prize pre- uh, speech and he, where he said that you know uh, strindberg had a very deep influence on him so if you understand that from that point of view then you know that he is also talking about heredity and environment as important attributes of naturalism of a kind of a realism that plays its part so when mary fears for edmund that he might have consumption then she already has the father's illness in mind you know which she might have uh, taken and might have passed on to edmund so in a way there is a sense of the past which keeps haunting in fact this idea of the past which keeps haunting the present is also there in ibsen's ghost for instance where the son has to carry the sins of the father right and is plagued by it so the tragedy unfolds because uh, you know he becomes aware of this uh, disease which he has taken from his father now the idea is that a similar sort of a uh, motif is being used by uh, here Uji, eugene o'neil not necessarily in the same way as um strindberg did but certainly this motive the idea of the past of of uh, your environment your social environment as also your uh, you know biological self uh, they keep reasserting themselves in the text so the past in a way is something that keeps returning in fact you know there is um, uh, there is in the play this quote by mary where um, she talks about this very interesting thing uh you know where she says that that you know the past is really what the present is uh and and that's that i find very interesting in the text because uh, uh, you know that that in a way in a nutshell gives you this the idea the center of the text if you look at the screen you will you will be able to see this quote from uh the text by mary she says and i quote the past is the future isn't it it's the future uh, it's the future too the sorry the past is the present isn't it it's the future too we all try to lie out of that but life won't let us now that i find very interesting that the past is the present 
and it's also the future would you agree with such a uh, no, no, it's, it's a very profound statement you know in the sense that uh, uh, time is indivisible and uh, things that have already gone by they they express themselves in the present and uh, the present is not un uh, under your control you are not um, participating in the making of the future directly because uh, the past and the com combination of the past and the present don't allow you that Right. It's, a, it's a very profound. So you know a, that is true. What what I also found was that in a way, what she's saying is that you know, in a way, these characters are all haunted by their past, and they somehow live in the past. Mm -hmm. In fact, Mary at the end of the play, uh, you know, and that's that's uh, that's that's also the adds to the nightmarish quality. You know, when she's become totally consumed in morphine, and the men can't deal with this reality anymore. That they have to deal again with their mother being an addict, and they have to deal with her again, and they all love her deeply, and. Um, they, they're all affected and deeply affected by this kind of dev development in the house and uh, when she's gone into it then they've all taken to alcohol and they're sitting in their living room and having uh, drinks uh, after another one drink after another and Mary climbs down the stairs with her wedding gown in her one hand and she's dressed you know she's plaited her hair as if a young girl in convent and she's gone back so she relapses but you know she's relapsing in her past she just goes uh, to different points in time in the past, so each time she's, uh, you know, she's she's become she's gone into a morphine consumption. Each time she's left the present and gone into the past and begins to be there and live in that moment. So towards the end of the play, the where, where the plane actually ends, and it's very interesting that her uh, son Jamie uh, says that well enters Ophelia. You know, mm -hmm. so in a way, she's you know she's dressed in her nightgown, carrying a white wedding dress, and dragging it as she comes down to the living room, and and she leaves it there, and you know, so the dragging of the wedding gown in itself is telling us a, a lot about the is symbolic of the marriage itself that she has with the husband, and you know she's and the husband is careful, and he says you're going to uh, mess it up, you're going to tear it, and she doesn't care about this, she just leaves it midway, and the husband picks it up as as a kind of a symbolic act to still still. Uh, you know, save their marriage, which is uh, utterly impossible in the present context. I I actually uh, uh, appreciate the word you, use, you are using, symbolic. It's a highly symbolic play. Mm -hmm. uh, things you know don't seem to happen, but they suggest lots of lots of complications that that characters have gone into. Right. So imagine only at this level of symbol, you can understand that the morning has become the the middle of their life. And they have matured, and they become adults, right. and and that's a decline. Yes, very true. So in a in a way, this entire day is not just a day; it's the life of the characters. Because mm. in their heads, they are going back in time when they were kids. They are, each one is blaming one another and talking about that period when she gave birth to the son and the doctor wasn't called and all of that. So the, it's like they're all you know they're they're at a boiling point. And in many ways, I feel this play, as you said, is very com you know it's full of complexity. I do feel it's also very Freudian in that sense because mm. you know they're all returning to their past and there is something there is a kind of a deep rooted grudge that is emerging from that past mm -hmm. so uh, you know Mary for the, for instance at the end has become this little girl still in the convent and you know she's th she's talking to uh, her teacher and she's talking to uh, you know talking about becoming a nun and saying that you know oh how I'd like to become a nun so you know there is uh, Anne dragging and then she realizes oh then, then I met a man uh, Jamie Tyrone so you know there is a sense that there is the past which keeps which which so Mary actually goes back into the past actually much like Amanda for instance in um, Williams the glass menagerie who keeps going back you know she she just for for a moment goes back you know into her past and she's living there so Mary is actually going back in the past because that's the only place where she finds peace and comfort from the time there is a, there is a significant uh, uh, you know a question that uh, one might uh, uh, you know uh, raise at this, at this point uh, does this play also attempt to have a connect with the world outside or is it a biography of the family yeah uh, it is at the center it is an autobiographical play of mm -hmm. uh, uh, eugene o'neill so it's the biography of the family but then it is it is tells us some that's what i'm saying mm -hmm. so you could choose to see it just as an artistic play you know with a lot of quotations from here and there to uh, enlighten you about the scene and about the biography of the family mm -hmm. or there is a deeper underlying uh, context 
which is not very clearly presented by the playwright and yet it is uh, it is there so uh, you know for instance i'll I, i'd like to quote here this one final truth about uh, their lives that edmund talks about when he mm-hmm. confronts his father with the bitter truth of their existence mm-hmm. he says and i quote he says because you've never given her anything that would help her want to stay off it mm. off it as in morphine, morphine. Mm. because you've never given her anything that would help her stay off it no home except the summer dump in a place she hates and you've refused even to spend money to make this look decent mm. while you keep buying more property and playing sucker for every con man with a gold mine or a silver mine or any kind of get rich quick swindle you've dragged her around the road season after season one night stands with no one she could talk to waiting night after night in dirty hotel rooms for you to come back with a bun on after the bars closed christ is it any wonder she didn't want to be cured this is the world outside right and that world is evoked through the the, the family structure exactly mm. so it is this world outside you know mm. uh, the idea that uh, the father is now again very freudian the father because he has lived in a in 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 conditions which were far from comfortable you know where he's seen this kind of life of privation he's so scared because he thinks that uh, and from the beginning he says land is what i want to buy mm. because if you have land then you feel safer otherwise we'll all end up in and le- end up in a poor house so there is a deep rooted fear of being of ending up in a poor house that makes him keep buy lands and he's a miser he's stingy doesn't spend money on anything and so he's not able to buy a home for her while he keeps buying properties and putting them on rent so he's entered the world of the market and the world of money mm-hmm. and he finds that he is deeply in it and he's unable to get out of it mm-hmm. in fact at one point in time uh, we find that um, james tyron tells uh, uh, you know edmund that uh, that you know that i have fallen into this and i have no way of coming out of it and i don't know when i became a slave to it that is money that is this easy money that i'm making that, that it is the other world right mm-hmm. so you know it's it's in this sense a kind of a play that is uh, deep rooted in that kind of truth uh, of their lives and this is what gives uh, uh, you know gives it the external the outside world's edge you know so the idea that uh, so James Tyron seems to feel that you know you will feel better if you have something outside if you possess uh, land or you have property while the idea that uh, is being projected by every other character is that having something possessing something uh, in the outside world does not ensure possessing one's spiritual health mm-hmm. and that that is deteriorating uh, despite the efforts of the father that that uh, you know and he says that i made a good success and let me quote this one bit he tyron says i made a great success in the theater and he says uh, a great money success and it ruined me with its promise of easy fortune so while easy fortune promised him success great money success mm-hmm. it ruined him as a person he says i didn't want to do anything else and by the time i woke up to the fact i'd become a slave to the damn thing so you know that's that's what i'm talking about that he had become a slave to money and he cannot see family relations or home as as uh, beyond this so because he is so deeply taken in and the idea of not being able to have a home of their own and you know moving from one hotel to the other because he's an actor that has played his life she's delivered children in hotel rooms and you know the her life has been so she's not had a community life you know at one place she also mentions that how other people have a community life and they have a social life and that we've never had it we've been uh, cut up and we've been uh, it's been the end of our family so it's about biography and the loneliness and isolation of the family but also at a larger level about this careerism and success mantra that uh, james tyron follows and so wants his one, children to follow can one suggest that uh, the outside world uh, you know lurks behind the the actual experiences that are presented on the stage and uh, the outside world also works at the level of uh, the mind where he is fighting his demons those demons you know are, are are the outside world but those demons are also from the past experiences you mm-hmm. know so the demons of the outside world continue to haunt them and uh, there is a there is a sense of fatalism there attached that you know uh, that 
there is no possible way of redeeming oneself in the present situation mm -hmm. and so there is a sense of this helplessness uh, that each character experiences and there is and each one has ac accepted that tragedy about oneself that each mm -hmm. one is as tragic uh, as the other so uh, in that sense i think and that's the joining thread perhaps of american drama that you know they show when they show tragedy of characters then it's not just one person's tragedy it is the tragedy of each character in a play and even the best characters or even the character that appears to be normal is actually uh, abnormal in many ways and is complex uh, in many ways so i think that's where uh, i think this play comes in uh, for instance when en edmund quotes nietzsche in the play you know he says uh, you know uh, uh, christ i felt like you he, uh, edmund in the play says it's all a frame up we are all fall guys you know it's all a frame up we are all fall guys and suckers and we can't beat the game so the idea is that the game is to keep trying to uh, find spiritual happiness but the inability to find it you know so they all there is at one level a will to live you know for people for the love that you have for people but again there is this inevitability that it is almost impossible to live a normal life you know mm. that kind of that the the will to have this kind of a sense of happiness and uh, the inability to have it and the impossibility of it as well in the present situation so well, the game uh, is about uh, mm. trying but you are always beaten in this game so uh, would you like to uh, conclude this play with the point that uh, the, so far as this character is concerned there's no future for him would you say that I think there is a sense that there is no future in this family as such yes. because uh, you know one is an alcoholic and the other is vain and also uh, has fallen apart the mm. wife is uh, uh, has is addicted to morphine now and may not ever come back so there is a kind of dissipation of this sort but um Uh, um i don't know how to really retrieve this play and call it an optimistic <laughs> ending in that sense uh, really no your job is to be realistic yeah. Re retrieving the play is not the critic's job right mm. so uh, in that sense i do think that uh, this play is a rejection of many religious or you know it's a clash of moral forces at the end of the day you know it's it's how uh, the forces of morality are clashing with one another uh at the end of the day whether and 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 this in this struggle these characters are uh projected uh the who are unable to um, cope with their surroundings the second coming is not going to happen in this play doesn't look like <laughs> okay friends it's a bleak uh, drama i mm. think it's a bleak drama that mm. is being projected here and uh, the tragedy is something that that the writer also sometimes perhaps values in so um it's almost like there is a kind of a need to be in there and uh, in in his tears and blood that is so friends uh, we have had a uh, great discussion on the play uh, very sh uh, sharply uh, edged you know in, in in the ideology of the time and uh, there you know uh, the the meaning uh, afforded afforded by 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 the analysis is that uh, unless one really comes out of the scene and uh, looks at it objectively There's, there is no answer to the, the the present day the contemporary problems that are put there so i think it's a very meaningful discussion and it raises questions about uh, america of today um, at, about america of the time when the, the when the playwright was around and he was writing and that it's a very educative kind of uh, reading that that that, that uh, is, is provided by the by by the play and the playwright thank you